Welcome back. This time out, I'm going to go over more detail about helix design and how the diameter of your helix can affect the grade and how this all works out when deciding on the final height of your helix. Now, I made this chart to show you how your helix changes as you change the radius or the number of turns or the grade in your helix. This is my rise versus radius versus number of turns versus grade versus vertical height versus track length table. That's easy for you to say. I wanted to show how the grade and the clearance changes with your radius. Also, I wanted to show you just how much track a helix can consume. Now, I used anywhere from 24 inch to 36 inch radius in this chart. As you can see, I have the rise over here in inches of your helix, the radius, the number of turns in that helix, the grade in percent, the vertical height per turn that you get for that grade, how long your helix track will be in inches and in feet. Now I got the clearance and grade info from the AnyRail tool and the other numbers I worked out with the previous formulas that we have gone over. Now you don't have to make a chart like this. You can just keep plugging numbers in until you get what you want. I just made this chart to use as an example. Okay, let's go back to AnyRail. So here we have a four turn helix that rises 12 inches. In the real world, you'll probably want a rise that is more than 12 inches, but 12 inches is a good example to work with. With four turns over that 12 inches, we have three inches per turn. And as you can see, we have a 2% grade throughout the helix. But let's say that we want to have four inches between the turns. That means we're gonna to have to go to a three turn helix. So right now, note that we have that 2% grade. Let's try three turns and see what we get. So here we have a pre-curved piece of track. It's 90 degrees and it's a 24 inch radius. So let's create a helix. We're gonna come down here. Our starting point is gonna be zero inches. The ending point is going to be 12 inches. And we want three turns in our helix. So let's plug that number in. I'm gonna click up here and see what I get. And you'll notice that it has gone to 2.7% and our height per turn is four inches, which is what we wanted. So let's just click, click OK. So here's our new helix with three turns, four inches between each turn. But you'll notice that our grade went to 2.7%. And that exceeds our original design requirements by 0.7%. Now, if you consider this new grade of 2.7% too high, what can you do? Well, let's look at our chart again. So let's look at the changes we can make in a 12 inch rise helix right here. We started with 24 inches and four turns in our helix, and that gave us a 2% grade, but only three inches between each turn. So then we changed to three turns and that gave us four inches between turns, but it kicked our grade up to 2.7%. So if we kick our radius up to 30 inches from 24 inches, that will give us our vertical height per turn of four inches, and we'll use a three turn helix as you see here. And that takes our grade down to 2.1%, which is really close to our target grade. But notice over here what happens to our track length in inches. When we had 24 inch radius with three turns, the track length in our helix was 445 inches or 37 feet. By going to 30 inch radius, our track length in inches is now 571 inches or 48 feet. We've added 11 feet to the length of our track in that helix. Also, the diameter of our helix has gone from 48 inches or four feet to 60 inches or five feet. By going to a larger radius, we can get a lower grade percent, but we also kick up the amount of track that we're going to be using. So just for the heck of it, let's go back to any rail and plug in some of those numbers. So here's a piece of curved track. And as you can see down below, it's got a 30 inch radius. Let's create a helix. We're going to go to 12 inches. We're going to do three turns and that gives us a slope percentage, a gradient of 2.1% and a height per turn of four inches. But remember, 
we now went from a 48 inch diameter loop to a 60 inch diameter loop. And remember, that 60 inches is just the diameter of your track. That track is going to sit on your plywood base, and that base must be wider still. Now, most sites I looked at recommend at least two inches on either side of the center line of your track for safety. So if we add two inches from the center line of our track, we now have a plywood diameter of 64 inches. So as you can see, there's a bunch of give and take in the design of our helix. Since I've not built a helix using the AnyRail tool, my goal here is to give you enough information so you can play around with it and try plugging in different values until you get something that looks like it would work. If I was building a helix for the first time using AnyRail and using the information that I have told you here, I think I would do a mock-up of my design to make sure that everything is going to fall into place correctly. I guess that's a, a disclaimer of sorts. Don't take what the bald man behind the microphone says is the gospel truth. Ever. Okay, let's go back to those details that we can get from our Helix design. Now this is the details that you get from AnyRail when you click on Details. I saved it as a TXT file and then I put it into Microsoft Word because it looks better in Microsoft Word than it does say in Notepad. And as you can see, here are all the pieces of track with their beginning and ending heights. And in this example, I have changed the heights to be highlighted in red. Now, as I told you in video 35, any rail displays the track in a random order. One would think that any rail would put them in the correct order for you, but one would be wrong for thinking that. This is any rail, and I'm sure there's a good reason for them to be all jumbled up. Now, when you save the detail file, it'll be saved as a text file, so you could open it in WordPad or Notepad, or as I did here in Microsoft Word. Let's take a look at a corrected chart in Microsoft Word. So here's my corrected details list that I made in Microsoft Word, and I'll go over what all this means. Now, first off, I rearranged the track sections so they are in ascending order. As you can see here, we're starting with zero and we're working our way up in three quarter inch increments. One of the things I found when doing this is that any rail will sometimes put the higher elevation first and then the lower elevation. So these two lines of numbers here will be reversed. And I also found that it will flip these numbers around randomly through the file. It just means when you arrange it in order so that you can build your helix from it, you're just going to have to do more work. Now, I went through and I changed the font size and color of all the track beginning and ending heights. I made them bold and italicized so they would be easier to find. So let's take a look at a single section and I'll describe the details. This number here is the Walther's track piece number that is used in the AnyRail Walther's track library. The FL that you see here, I have no idea what that means. Here is the full name of the piece of track and what size rail it is. In this instance, it's HO Walders slash Shinohara code 83 track. This is telling us that it's a piece of flex track and this piece of track is 37 and 11 16 inches long. Over here we have the curve radius, 24 inches, and the angle of the curve. In this case, it's 90 degrees. Now you come down here, and for some reason, known only to any rail, it's telling us the length of the track again, 37 and 11 16 inches. Now, this first set of numbers here, right here, this is the X and the Y coordinates for the beginning of this piece of track. And this number, of course, is the height of the track at this X, Y coordinate. This is telling us what angle the end of the track is pointing at. Now you come down here and obviously we're looking at the other end of that piece of track, the end of the track that is now three quarters of an inch higher. And this is the X and the Y coordinates for that end point. And then this is the angle that that end point is pointing at. And that makes sense because we have a 90 degree angle. We're starting at 90 degrees and we're ending at 180 degrees. Now, note where it says the track length. It's telling us this piece of track is 37 and 11 16 inches long. Now here's a good way to check your calculations. I can take that length and I can multiply it by four. And if I do, I get 150 and three quarter inches. 
Now, in our example, in video 35, we calculated the circumference of our helix at 150 inches. And if we multiply these, we get a circumference of 150 and 3 quarter inches. Now, near as I can figure, and most times that ain't very near to reality, what you calculate and what any rail and model buildings.org calculators calculate don't always agree. And you will see an example of that later in this video. So I think that's probably enough information to show you how to use the AnyRail Helix tool. In your design, like I said before, you'll probably be trying different values until you get what you want. So just keep plugging them into the AnyRail Helix tool. So let's say we want to go 16 inches and we want four loops and then click anywhere but OK. Just come up and click like right here and you'll get your slope percentage and your height per turn. And if you don't like that, you can say, well, let's try this. Let's do 20 and then click anywhere else and you'll get your new values coming up down here. And when you finally get it right, then you can hit OK and create your helix. That's a pretty good way to try different values for your helix design. So let's review the important points of helix design. First, you need to know how high you need to raise your track. Second, what radius do you want? Remember, a smaller radius over the same height results in a steeper grade. Or instead, for your second item, decide on the grade in percent that seems appropriate, and then work from there. Third, the larger your track radius, the wider the diameter of your helix. Fourth, your track diameter is the number you calculate, say 48 inches, but for the final diameter of each turn, you will have to take into account the width of your sub roadbed with its one or two inches on either side of the track center line. Fifth, take into account the thickness of your cork roadbed and the sub roadbed plus any sub roadbed joint plates that you install. Make sure that not only can you reach in there to re-rail a car or do maintenance work, but ensure that you still have clearance enough between the helix turns for all of your rolling stock. This is especially important if your helix is located inside your scenery. Finally, let's go over the calculations you might need before starting. First, it is handy to be able to work out the length of your helix versus the grade. Say I want to raise my track 20 inches and use a 32 inch radius curve. I want four inches between each loop, so I would need five loops. So the first thing I would do here is I would multiply my radius times two, which means I would have a helix composed of 64 inch diameter loops. Now I need to get the length of track for each loop, so I would use this formula. Circumference is equal to diameter times 3.14 or pi. And in this example, we would take 64 times 3.14, and we would end up with 200.96 inches. Now we're going to round that up to 201 inches. And I'm rounding up just to make the math a little more complicated, and it makes the example look more like something you might encounter in the real world. So I have five loops in my helix. So I would multiply 5 times 201, and that equals out that I would have 1,005 inches of track in my helix. Wow, that's a lot of track. Now, I'd like to know what my grade in percent is going to be for that helix. So what I do is I take my height, and I divide it by my length of track. And I end up with 20 inches, my rise, divided by 1,005 inches, which is the length of my track, and that works out to 0.0199%, or 1.9%. And you could take those numbers, plug them into the AnyRail tool, and they're going to come out close, as you're going to see. Or you can use these numbers to do what I'm going to do in the next video and design a helix on your own. Now, there's another way that we could do this. Again, we're going to start with our rise, because we know we want to bring that track up 20 inches. And then we say... We want a grade of 2%, and we're going to need five loops because we want four inches between each loop. So this time we're going to have to start with what is the length of our track in our helix. So our length of track, again, is height divided by grade, so 20 inches divided by 0.02, which is 2%, 
equals 1,000 inches of track. And you'll notice we have a 5 inch difference here. Now I'm going to go off on a little tangent here. Instead of using 2%, if we had plugged in 0.0199, we would have ended up with 1,005 inches of track. So now we need to know the number of inches of track per loop, and I apologize for these running together. I didn't catch that before I started recording the video. So we know we have 1,000 inches of track. We're going to divide that by our number of loops, and we end up with 200 inches per loop. And that 200 inches is also the circumference of our track. Now, we're going to need to know the diameter of our loop. And to get the diameter, it's circumference divided by 3.14, or pi. So we'll take 200, divide that by 3.14, and we get 63.69426752 inches. But that's kind of hard to work with, so we'll just round that up to 64 inches. And then to get our track radius, we just take our diameter divided by 2, so we have 64 divided by 2, and we end up with 32 inch radius. Now, if you don't round out all the numbers when you do this, it's all going to work out really, really close to the rounded number calculation. It's going to be really close. I mean, really, rounding our results is good enough for building a model railroad. So I know I'm belaboring the point, but let's uh, plug these numbers into the AnyRail calculator. So we'll start with a nice 90 degree section of track that has a radius of 32 inches. Click on it. Hit Helix. We want to go up 20 inches, and we want five loops. Click up here, take a look at it, and we got 2% and a height per turn of four inches. And this is exactly what we were asking for when we started our design. So let me hit OK. Now, if I click on a piece of track, and I'll highlight this one, and I look down below here, you'll see the length of that piece of track. And in this case, the way any rail calculated this helix, this piece of track turns out to be 50 and one quarter inches long. Now, if we multiply that by four, the number of pieces of track in a helix turn, you'll get 201 inches. And now multiply that by five, the number of turns in our helix, and guess what you get? You get 1,005 inches. Now, I'll leave it up to you to decide which method you want to start with, but in the end, the numbers either end up the same or they're really, really close. All right, I know I went over things and over things again and again, but if you're like me, sometimes you really just have to practice this until you, uh, until you understand. At least that's the way my little brain works. So hopefully, you should now be able to design a helix for your railroad. Now, like I said at the beginning of 35, I have never built a helix of my own design. So if someone out there looks at these two videos and decides this guy has absolutely no idea what he's talking about, let me know where I went wrong and I'll correct it. Now, in the next video, I'm going to try a different way to make a helix. Now, why am I doing that? Well, first of all, it's because I'm crazy. And also, I like to be able to dissect my designs. But I think you might find it interesting. And one of the things I'm going to show you in that video gives you a good idea why you might want to design your helix using this other method. Plus, doing it this way shows you what fun you can have trying new ideas with AnyRail. Okay, so we'll see you in video 37.